Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, for it is, <clears throat> excuse me, got a little frog in my throat and he wants to beat it. Okay, <clears throat> here we go. Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift who were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucified themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. Again, you take it on its own, and you don't look at any of the context. In Hebrews 6 and the rest of the book of Hebrews, it is very easy to come to the conclusion that you can lose your salvation, but that's not what it's talking about. If this passage does mean that you can lose your salvation, it also means that it's impossible to be saved again. We need to understand that the recipients of the book of Hebrews were Jews who were being taught in the church. Some, after seeing what they saw and learning what they learned, were wanting to go back to temple sacrifices. Now, all of these things in this three verses are true of, of, of unbelievers. What? Explain that, Pastor. I'm going to. Unbelievers can be enlightened. As in, the whole, as, as in the Old Testament, enlightenment often means that somebody has been exposed to knowledge. We even use that expression today. You know what? Enlightenment. Just like the pagan false teachers we just talked about who rejected Christ for false doctrine, these Jews had been to discipleship meetings. Let's look at Hebrews 5.12. For when, for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again which be the first principles of the oracles of God. What are those first principles? Well, Hebrews 6, 1 through 3. And by the way, first principles is a reference to the Old Covenant. Hebrews 6, 1 through 3. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, and of the laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. This we will do if God permit. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. If you're born again, you never leave the principles of the doctrine of Christ. That's your bread and butter. Going on to perfection, according to the rest of Hebrews, means leaving the old covenant behind and coming to Christ. See, they had been exposed to the gospel. <coughs> the principles of the doctrine of Christ. <clears throat> Excuse me again. They've been exposed to the gospel. They've had the Old Testament explained. And now, Paul is saying, come into salvation. Okay? Going on to perfection means leaving the Old Covenant behind and <clears throat> submitting yourself to Jesus Christ, the Savior. Christians, again, we never leave the doctrine of Christ. So these Jews are told to leave behind all of the explanations about how these Old Covenant teachings point to Jesus. Repentance, faithfulness, ceremonial washings. <clears throat> By the way, doctrine of baptisms. There's only one baptism in the New Testament. Now, don't get me wrong, there are several several modes of baptism, but there's only one, <clears throat> not several. Let me go back. I got my eye teeth. I, I, I got my tongue tied around my eye teeth. There are several applications of baptisms in the New Testament. But there's only one that we do in the church, as opposed to the many ceremonial washings of the Old Testament. Okay? So, there's only one ceremonial washing under the New Covenant, which is baptism. The mikveh. The dunking. Okay? Some Jews who had come into the church now were not yet believers, but they came in with curiosity, wanting to learn why the first century church believed Jesus was the Messiah. Some felt like they needed to have the teachings explained again because they weren't convinced. But the writer of Hebrews is saying that if God permit, they should move on from these things. Verse 3 refers back to verse 1. Moving on to perfection, folks, is getting saved. Accepting the sacrifice of forever perfects the believer. And much of this book is spent defining the Old Covenant as imperfect, and the New Covenant, <clears throat> as well as Christ himself, is perfect. The law made nothing perfect. Hebrews 7, 19. The sacrifices of the law could not make anyone perfect. Hebrews 10, 1. <coughs> Jesus is perfect. Hebrews 5, 9. The new covenant tabernacle is perfect. Hebrews 9, 11. 
The new covenant makes the spirits of men perfect. Hello, spiritual resurrection. Hebrews 12, 23, and he also sees shades of it in 13, 21. These Jews understood the teachings, but that doesn't mean they were regenerated by the knowledge. Hebrews 4, 2 shows that knowledge must be mixed with faith. Romans 1.18 shows it, it is possible to hold the truth in unrighteousness. 2 Timothy 3.7 speaks of men that continue to attain knowledge but never come to the knowledge of the truth, which in context is a reference to salvation. These Hebrews had been taught the truth, but they did not come to salvific knowledge in Jesus. Listen. Unbelievers can and do taste of the heavenly gift. Now the word taste is often synonymous with experience in the Bible. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Just as Jesus tasted of death, He experienced death. But tasting does not necessarily mean they were born again. Ever tasted something and spit it out without ingesting it? Jesus did. Matthew 27, 31, 34. Let me go back. Matthew 27, 34. They gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. So Christ tasted the cup of vinegar, but he did not drink of it. These Jews tasted the faith, but they did not ingest it. So many simply tasted the water of life. When Jesus said in John 4, 14, that whosoever drinketh of this water that I shall give him shall never thirst. Drinking as opposed to tasting. We need to do more than taste with the faith. We need to drink our fill. When it comes to death, Jesus tasted the whole thing because he had to. Death can't be divided like liquid or like a pizza. There's no such thing as being a little dead. Somebody could say, hey, did you taste the pizza? You say yes because you maybe had a bite of it. But here's the thing. You haven't tasted the whole pizza. And if you did taste the whole pizza, I don't want any. No such thing as being a little dead. You can taste part of something, but you haven't tasted the whole thing until you've ingested it. Jesus tasted the entire, the entirety of death. Listen, the point here is that these people only tasted of the heavenly gift. Having an experience with Jesus does not mean you become born again. The subjects of Matthew 7, 21-23 clearly had an experience with Jesus. They even called Him Lord and He told them, I never knew you. Not I knew you, then I didn't know you, but I never knew you. Moving on. There is a way in which unbelievers are made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Oh, come on, Pastor. we got to push the button here and turn on those heresy lights. I can prove it. The Holy Spirit certainly does not indwell an unbeliever. And the Greek, metokos, means companion. It's translated in Hebrews 1.9 as fellows. And in Luke 5, 7, as associates. So look at this. Does the Holy Spirit have any ministry to unbelievers? Yes, He does. The Spirit reproves the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. John 16, 8. The Holy Spirit testifies of Christ. John 15, 26. The Holy Spirit is the Word. And it's the Word that is being given to unbelievers. John 6, 63. The Holy Spirit was all around these Jews in that fellowship. And these Jews had heard the gospel, had the Spirit working on them, reproving them of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And Paul is saying, don't reject what the Holy Spirit's doing. Move on to perfection. Come to Jesus. <clears throat> They're being drawn to Christ. The Holy Spirit's calling them to the gospel. And they're resisting. As Acts 7.51 says, ye do always resist the Holy Spirit. Hello, Calvinists. Listen up. Unbelievers can taste the good word of God and the powers of the world to come as well by hearing and witnessing them. So the reference to uh, of Hebrews 6.4 is not believers. It's not people that have lost their salvation or that you can lose your salvation. The reference is those who received knowledge about Jesus, had an experience with Jesus, had been convicted by the Holy Spirit, had instructions from the Word, had seen the miracles, and they had not come to Christ for the spiritual resurrection. The repentance spoken here is essentially what happened to the stony ground hearers in Matthew 13, verses 20 and 21. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same as that heareth the Word, and I know the joy receiveth it. 
yet hath not root in himself, not born again, but dureth for a while in the flesh. I'm doing that so you know, I'm, I'm giving commentary in the flesh. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. The specific falling away here is being dealt with by the author of Hebrews. It's a specific reference going back to the temple sacrifices. If they did this, they could never come back and start all over again with Jesus because they had already openly shamed him by being part of the Christian fellowship and then going back to the temple. It was not the saving repentance that brought them to Christ for salvation. They apparently wanted to go through the teachings again so that they could make a decision. And Paul said, hey, we need to move on. They may have even been profession, professing believers at one point, though they were not born again. Again, see Matthew 7, 21 to 23, which shows us that professing believers, that shows us the case of professing believers that have no relationship with Christ. I never knew you. Lord, Lord, I never knew you. Lord, look at what we did. I never knew you. But Lord, we were not serving you. I never knew you. Depart from me. These Jews had come to the Christians looking for answers, and they were given answers. There should be no more reason for them to continue seeking basic knowledge in the truth. Hey, explain this Jesus thing to me again. Explain how he fulfills all this stuff again. There's no reason for it. They've already had it explained. It's now time to make a decision. So if they went back to the temple sacrifice system after coming to this knowledge of the truth, they were essentially holding the truth in unrighteousness and could not come back to the truth in Christ because their hearts would have been hardened because of their decision to reject Him. At any rate, <clears throat> these were not born again, and if they went back, <clears throat> excuse me, they went back to the temple sacrifices, they could never be born again because they knew the truth to be the truth and they turned away from it. Their hearts would be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, Hebrews 3.13, and, in an, and with an evil heart of unbelief, Hebrews 3.12. They're not born again. They're not spiritually resurrected. And instead of moving on to perfection in Jesus, they would resist the Holy Spirit and depart from the living God and going back to the temple. If this verse was a reference to save people falling away from salvation, it would contradict not only the prodigal son account, as well as several biblical verses, including Hebrews 10.14, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. What does forever mean? Forever. What is it in the Hebrew? Forever. What is it in the Greek? Forever. What's it in the Spanish? Forever. What is it in the German? Forever. It doesn't matter what language. The word forever means forever. Returning to the temple sacrifices after learning and experiencing what they did would mean they would be attempting to crucify Jesus again. And as those who were already perceived as Christians by other Jews, they would be putting Jesus to an open shame. I thought you said he was the Messiah. Well, I saw you fellowshipping with that church over there. Well, I guess I guess that Jesus thing just doesn't just isn't right, is it? Because here you are back over here at the temple. Mm, mm, mm. They would be denying the sufficiency of the sacrifice as though it wasn't enough, so they went back to the temple. Hebrews 6, 4-6 has nothing to do with born-again people losing their salvation. 